Good evening. Please be seated. My name is John Heibusch. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for this special evening. Before I invite our host for this evening to the microphone to introduce our special guest, I want to make sure that we recognize several distinguished people who have joined us tonight. Now, the issue is that there are so many that I'd like to ask you to hold your applause uh, until I've recognized them all. Otherwise, I know that our foreign secretary will only have about three minutes with which to give remarks. So I'll begin with Sir Peter Westmacott, Her Majesty's Ambassador to the United States of America and his wife, Lady Westmacott. Members of the diplomatic corps, including Dame Barbara Hay, British Council here in Los Angeles, Rudy Vestraten, Council General of Belgium, Abdullah Asabusi, the Council General of the UAE, and Mr. Kantia Sufamankam, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. Distinguished guests from the Pacific Council on International Policy, including their co-chair, Mickey Cantor, President Clinton's former US Trade Representative and Commerce Secretary, and his wife, Heidi Schulman. Also from the Pacific Council, President Reagan's former ambassador to Finland, Mr. Rock Schnabel, and his wife, Marna. We have with us as well from the Council's board, Mrs. Lynn Booth and Dr. Bradford Edgerton. Members of the British delegation, including Chloe Dalton, Michael Hoare, and Charles Morgan, all key advisors to Secretary Haig. We have two state senators with us tonight, Margaret Dayton from Utah and Jim Somerville from Tennessee. Former Congressman Elton Gallagher. Elton represented the Reagan Library since its very inception. Author and journalist Lou Cannon and his wife Mary. Former University of California Regent Ward Connolly. Mr. Duke Blackwood, director of the Reagan Library. And finally, I'd like to give a warm welcome to the almost 20 GE Reagan scholars and their families who are with us tonight. These are some truly talented upcoming college freshmen who will be attending universities across the United States this fall. They were chosen from over 11,000 applicants and just last night awarded scholarships of $40,000 each made possible by the Reagan Foundation and GE. It is great to have all of you here as well. So would you please join me in welcoming all of these special guests. <laughs> Given we have with us this evening one of the highest ranking members of the British government, a person of extraordinary prominence on the world stage. It is only fitting that the man to introduce him would carry a special prominence in both US foreign affairs, as well as important history with the Reagan Foundation and Library. Bob Tuttle hails from a remarkable family, one that has been close to the Reagans for many years. It is no exaggeration to say that were it not for the involvement of the Tuttles in Ronald Reagan's early years in California politics, there likely would have been no Governor Ronald Reagan and therefore no President Ronald Reagan. To this day, Bob and his wife Maria, who is with us tonight, enjoy a close relationship with Mrs. Reagan. His years of service on the Reagan Foundation Board of Trustees and his support for the Reagan Library have been critical to our institution's success. His service for President Reagan in the White House as Director of Presidential Personnel was but the beginning of his public service. His most recent duty to country, fittingly for tonight's role as our host, was as President Bush's US Ambassador to the Court of St. James in Great Britain. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Robert Tuttle. Very nice. You could do that all the time. <laughs> Good evening. On behalf of Mrs. Reagan and all the trustees of the Reagan Foundation, I'd like to welcome you here to tonight's event. It's a special privilege uh, for me to introduce our speaker because during my tenure uh, in the United Kingdom, William Hague was an important and valued colleague who became a good friend. Foreign Secretary Haig became a national figure at age 16 
when he addressed the Conservative Party's national conference. He graduated from Oxford University with first-class honors in philosophy, history, and economics. And he served as a president of the Oxford Union, which is a uh, noted route to political office. William was elected to Parliament in 1989 while still in his 20s. And a few years later, he joined the cabinet of Prime Minister John Major as Secretary of State for Wales. He was highly regarded by his peers and was elected leader of the Conservative Party in 1997 at the age of 36. He was the youngest leader of the party in the 20th century. And as party leader, he was known for his spirited weekly performance at Prime Minister's questions. While serving as a member of Parliament, he authored a biography of William Pitt um, the Younger, who was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Uh, that book won the British History Book of the Year Award in 2005. And several years later, he wrote a biography of William Wilberforce, the anti-slave trade campaigner who was primarily uh, uh, responsible for abolishing the slave trade in the United Kingdom. And that biography also received awards and high praise from the critics. In 2010, the newly elected Prime Minister, David Cameron, asked William Hague to become Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, a post he has held since that time. Foreign Secretary Hague believes, he believes in and is committed to our transatlantic alliance as the cornerstone of our common security. And his speeches, his policies, and his actions reflect this commitment. Among his priorities as Foreign Secretary has been the campaign he is leading to bring global attention to the need to eradicate sexual violence as a weapon of war and to bring women's rights to the front and center of foreign policy. He is, of course, respected as an excellent parliamentarian and is said to consider his greatest political achievement to be the design and passage through Parliament of the Disability and Discrimination Act, which has helped thousands in Great Britain. And if you'll uh, allow me, I'll just close on a personal note. In late 2005, shortly after arriving in London, I called on William at his office in Parliament. And at the end of our meeting, he told me that he expected David Cameron to shortly be elected leader of the Conservative Party. And he believed that the new leader may ask him to be the shadow foreign secretary. If that happened and he accepted, it would be at considerable sacrifice. But he thought he would accept. For William, public service is the highest calling. And of course, that is exactly what happened. And I strongly believe that the United Kingdom and its best friend and ally, the United States, are fortunate that William Hague, a great public servant, is the Foreign Secretary. Please welcome the Right Honorable William Hague. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Bob, ladies and gentlemen, it is a huge pleasure uh, to be here tonight uh, with my friend, Bob Tuttle, who did such a fine job as ambassador to the court of St. James. Uh, I feel a little bit, uh, having just traveled from Scotland to Doha to London to New York to here, that I'm slightly in danger of being like the man we speak about in our parliament who dreamt he was giving a speech in the House of Lords and woke up to find that he was. But, <laughs> but I was determined uh, to be here 
uh, because in 2011, Nancy Reagan invited me to take part in the celebrations of the centenary of the birth of President Reagan. And on a beautiful summer morning, with Condoleezza Rice and with Bob Tuttle, I helped to unveil the statue to him in London's Grosvenor Square. I am proud we found a home in our capital city for Ronald Reagan, a great American hero, one of America's finest sons, and a giant of 20th century history. He was the president who restored American confidence with inspirational leadership abroad and economic revival at home. A man of conviction who knew it was right to go to Berlin and say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, when that seemed impossible. And the statesman who won the Cold War, who Margaret Thatcher said, by inviting enemies out of their fortress and turning them into friends. And of course, the man of warmth and compassion whose words live on in our memories and will be remembered for generations. Having taken part in that moving occasion, it was an even greater honor when Nancy Reagan invited me to speak here at the presidential library they built together. I thank her and pay tribute to her, the equal partner in all President Reagan's endeavors, and the person he said could make him lonely just by leaving the room. We also remember Ronald Reagan gratefully for his friendship and warmth towards the United Kingdom. We're immensely proud of our alliance with the United States and what our two nations stand for and have achieved together. We remember Churchill and Roosevelt and the triumph over Nazi tyranny. And we think of Thatcher and Reagan when the fall of the Berlin Wall unleashed the 20th century's single greatest advance in human freedom. As a teenager, I was motivated to come into politics by Margaret Thatcher's vision and leadership. In one decade, and with the indomitable will of one woman, she confronted multiple dangers facing Britain, and put simply, she rescued our country. And two months ago, we mourned her passing. But I know that here in the Reagan Presidential Library, her memory will always be preserved and cherished. President Reagan and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher were often controversial leaders, and both had bitter enemies, as well as devoted followers. But both stood up fearlessly for their countries and raised them in the estimation of other nations. These qualities and this leadership will forever make them stand out in history. And millions of people who still say they object to their policies nevertheless still benefit from the prosperity and security they stood for and assured. A few minutes ago, I saw the piece of the Berlin Wall on display here. Today, communism is like that piece of masonry, an artifact of a failed ideology, torn down and discarded, although we should never forget the gulags and deprivation in North Korea, where it clings on in isolation and decay. I'm told of one family visiting here with their small daughter who turned to her parents and asked, what is communism? And it's because we stood firm in the Cold War that today's children can ask that question in tranquility. This library is a place to be inspired by how that dangerous era, that long repression of the human spirit for the sake of a soulless and drab uniformity, was finally ended. We live now in a world of almost unlimited access to information, at least in democratic societies. But we need our libraries just as much as in distant times when they were the only storehouses of knowledge. And we need to take time to absorb the lessons they hold for us. This library reminds us of fundamental truths about humanity. This place tells us that individual men and women can change the course of history through their ideas, examples, and constancy, as we all remember today as our thoughts dwell on Nelson Mandela and his family. We are not merely the victims of socio-economic trends. Through our own will and determination, we can accelerate positive change and avert disasters. These walls remind us that change for the better does not simply arise in the world. It comes from powerful exertion and example. Millions of people can have good intentions, but their efforts may be disconnected, ineffective, or accidentally destructive without transformational leadership. And this library testifies 
that it is not enough to believe in our values. We have to defend them and be a beacon of them, all the more so in periods where those values are threatened. Not all countries are willing to exert themselves to defend the freedoms they enjoy. But in the United Kingdom and the United States of America, we are. President Reagan, in his farewell address to the nation, told the story of an American sailor on the carrier Midway patrolling in the South China Sea in the 1980s. The sailor spied a small leaky boat full of refugees hoping to get to America. And then one of the refugees stood up and called out, hello, American sailor, hello, freedom man, freedom man. That the United States still stands as a beacon of freedom in the world should be a cause of immense pride. And there is no greater bastion of freedom than the transatlantic alliance and within it the special relationship, always solid but never slavish, as I always say. Our alliance is strong and enduring because it is built on the belief in human freedom, in democracy and in free markets and individual enterprise. The ability to channel our power and ingenuity in defense of our values has led to many of our greatest achievements over the generations. The liberation of Europe, the Berlin airlift, the founding of NATO, the end of the Cold War, and our efforts side by side, even when dogged by controversy, in Kuwait, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in Libya. This is not nostalgia for the past or starry-eyed idealism. It is our hard-headed national interest. And it is undiminished by the fact that both of our countries are adapting our foreign policy to the 21st century. Some say it is not possible to build up our country's ties in other parts of the world without weakening those ties between us. But I say these things go together. The stronger our relationships are elsewhere in the world, the more we can do to support each other and our allies. Foreign policy is not a zero-sum game. We can pursue parallel efforts, keeping our alliance as Western nations at the center of our thinking and endeavors. The foundations of the special relationship are sunk deep on both sides of the Atlantic, like those of a mighty building, invisible to the naked eye, but forming an immensely strong and unshakable structure. Anyone holding office in Britain or the US feels the strength of those foundations beneath their feet. It is there as a mainstay of our economies and will be an even greater source of prosperity if we can fulfill the immense promise of a transatlantic trade and investment partnership. It is a pillar of our armed forces who train together, plan operations together, and fight together. It's there in our unique nuclear cooperation and the trust between the Foreign Office and the State Department. It is that fortifying source of mutual strength at times of decision and crisis, what Margaret Thatcher called the two o'clock in the morning courage that only a friend or ally can furnish. And it's the fundamental underpinning of our security. We should have nothing but pride in the unique and indispensable intelligence sharing relationship between Britain and the United States. In recent weeks, this has been a subject of some discussion. Let us be clear about it. In both our countries, intelligence work takes place within a strong legal framework. We operate under the rule of law and are accountable for it. In some countries, secret intelligence is used to control their people. In ours, it only exists to protect their freedoms. We should always remember that terrorists plan to harm us in secret. Criminal networks plan to steal from us in secret. Foreign intelligence agencies plot to spy on us in secret. And new weapon systems are devised in secret. So we cannot protect the people of our countries without devising some of the response to those, those threats in secret. Because we share such strong habits of working together, political leaders in our countries can always share their thinking about how to maintain clear leadership, bold thinking, and decisive foreign policy in a shifting world. And it's in that spirit that I speak here tonight, offering my thoughts about the lessons of foreign policy in recent years and how we should apply them for the future. Being confident without being arrogant, leading without monopolizing, and taking pride in our societies while deepening our understanding of others in keeping with the finest qualities of our open societies. 
We are living through sobering hours in world affairs. Many Western nations face an immense economic challenge, accelerated by the financial crisis. We need to strengthen our enterprise economies, educate our young people, make new advances in competitiveness, or we risk being left behind in the global race taking place around us. This economic challenge is intensified by the surge forward of many emerging economies, which brings with it a challenge to our values. We see this in modern kleptocracies, where those in power take the benefits for themselves within an imitation of a free market economy or in today's crony capitalist systems which discredit or damage free enterprise, or in those countries pursuing state capitalism without political freedom. By failing to develop the open democracies or opportunity for all that go with a stable free enterprise economy, each of these is storing up social discontent for the future and will prove to be unsustainable. We know that capitalism and free markets only work properly when there are safeguards against monopoly of power, when information is freely available, and everyone who works hard or has a brilliant idea can share in success, underpinned by strong, independent political institutions. Alongside these challenges in the world, we can see the geopolitical landscape shifting and old certainties changing. We see the diffusion of power away from governments and into the hands of citizens, speeded by technology. We see the spreading of economic power and influence around the world to many more countries, many of which do not fully share our values. This makes it harder in the short term to deal with the many crises and problems confronting us, which include a much more fragmented but still dangerous terrorist threat on a wider front from Afghanistan to the Horn of Africa and the Sahel. Those problems also include an even more unsettled Middle East, where to old sores, new dangers are being added, social and political turmoil, new variants of terrorism and extremism, dangerous sectarian tensions, growing humanitarian crises, and the threat of nuclear proliferation. Taken together, we are living through an exceptionally turbulent and unpredictable period in world affairs, which may endure for decades to come. Facing all these threats and changes, some people think and argue that Western nations face more pressures than they can cope with and must be less ambitious. I draw the opposite conclusion, that it is time to re-energize and extend our diplomacy and seek to lead and work with others in new ways. And I want to set out five principles which should guide us through the turbulent decades ahead. First, we must reject the idea that Western nations face inevitable decline. Some predict gloomily that as emerging powers rise, so we in the West must fall. But our free and open societies are better placed to make the most of changes in the world, to adjust to it, and to cope with turbulence. We are not threatened fundamentally by the interconnected world with its flow of information and the empowerment of citizens. The demand for openness and change has hit autocratic states in North Africa and the Middle East so hard because they were so obviously failing to provide democracy, dignity, accountability, and economic opportunity for their people. But in different ways, the same demand for accountability will make itself felt in many other countries and is doing so already on several continents. If these trends sometimes put us under pressure, Think how worried it makes the autocratic regime that relies on keeping its people in the dark in order to stay in power. And if state capitalism is an economic challenge, our response should be to revitalize our own countries through extending our lead in human capital, reinforcing a culture of work, and by releasing to the full the ingenuity, dedication, loyalty, and diversity that only a truly free society can fully benefit from and mobilize. That's why in the United Kingdom in the last three years under our coalition government, we've begun the biggest education reforms in our modern history, we're making it pay to work by reforming our welfare system and have reduced jobs in the public sector by half a million already while creating a million and a quarter new jobs in the private sector. We don't need to accept sleepwalking into decline any more than Reagan and Thatcher did before us. We need to remind ourselves of the advantages that we possess. I sometimes urge British diplomats to imagine that we'd just woken up today to find our country had been planted in the world overnight 
and that we'd been given 60 million industrious citizens, a language that is spoken throughout the world, a seat on the UN Security Council, membership of the European Union, NATO, and the Commonwealth, a diplomatic network that is the envy of many nations, a nuclear deterrent, some of the finest armed forces in the world, and one of the largest development programs in the world, all of which we have in the United Kingdom. And on top of that, we have all the ingenuity, creativity, and resilience that is an ingrained part of our national character. We should rejoice, and if we were told this overnight, we would rejoice in our good fortune, not be filled with gloom that others have strengths as well. Much the same and more could be said of the United States of America. And we have centuries of experience in building up democratic institutions, from our courts to our free media, that other countries wish to draw on and adapt from Burma to North Africa. We have the soft power and cultural appeal to attract and influence others and win over global opinion. We have our entrepreneurs, lawyers, scientists, journalists, academics, artists, and activists sharing their knowledge and connecting with other nations outside of government but forming part of our international contribution. We've not yet exhausted all the means of building up and extending our influence. It's not so much the relative size of our power that matters in the 21st century, but the nature of it and how agile and effective we can be in exerting it. So while it will inevitably be a time of anxiety about dangers and our collective place in the world, it's also a time to be fired by a sense of optimism and opportunity and to extend our connections across the globe and use the inherent strengths of our societies to the full. And this leads to my second point, that in this turbulent and interconnected environment, we need more engagement with the world, not less, and we must build more connections with other countries, adapting our global role and not pulling back from it. At a time of spending reductions and financial pressures in the UK, we've decided to do what some might feel is counterintuitive and which has not yet been noticed by everyone. And indeed, we're the only European country to take this approach. We have embarked on reopening embassies and consulates we once closed and opening new ones, up to 20 in total at the moment, spreading British diplomacy to places that have not felt it in decades, while significantly strengthening our presence in many other locations. When I stood in Mogadishu two months ago and watched our flag being raised for the first time in 22 years, we were the first European country to open an embassy there since all the calamities in Somalia of recent years. Our diplomats at our new embassy in Haiti, opened two weeks ago, are our first there since the 1960s. From El Salvador to Paraguay, from Côte d'Ivoire to Kyrgyzstan, British embassies are opening instead of closing. We are reversing our retreat from Latin America. We now have more diplomatic posts in India than any other nation. We now have an embassy in every ASEAN country, one of the world's largest new markets. We already have one of the most extensive diplomatic networks in the world, but we've decided to enlarge it. And we do this in part to facilitate the export of British goods and services, because it's only through the growth of trade that we will lift up the world economy. But we also do it because over the coming decades, we need to do more to promote our values rather than assume we can impose them. It's also because we understand that there are more centers of decision-making than ever before, and we need to be present in them. And this reflects one of the paradoxes of the globalized world, which is that while retail products become more homogenized, people are also freer to be different. And we need to deepen our understanding of, not neglect, the culture, politics, and identity of other nations and work with the grain of them. And that's why in the reform of my department, I brought back historians to the center of the work of the Foreign Office. I'm opening a new language school this summer, and we're investing much more in geographic knowledge, cutting-edge diplomatic skills, and economic understanding. We will all have to go further afield for our prosperity. We all face threats, which if we don't address them at their source will affect us at home. And so we're extending our cooperation in countering terrorism to new partners, for instance. Not only is it not profitable to shrink away in the world, it's not safe to do so. For no nation or group of nations is going to increase the protection they offer to us. So we have to resist the temptation to turn inwards. Our vision for Britain in the world is of a nation committed to an international global role, 
an outward-looking and reliable partner that values and nourishes its traditional alliances with the United States, with European countries, but also with Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Gulf states, a country that makes the most of every network it is part of, including the Commonwealth, and makes the case for a reformed European Union that is more competitive, more responsive to the needs of its citizens, and more effective in using its weight in the world, and a nation that is expanding its diplomatic reach, a powerful force for development and human rights, with a renewed ability to make the most of a world not of blocks, but of networks. And this leads naturally to my third point, that we must be willing to create more overlapping networks of countries that work together on specific issues even when they differ with us on others. That is to take nothing away from the importance of NATO, the cornerstone of our security. Multilateral diplomacy is vastly important in a world of 200 countries with so many connections between them. But the ability of groups of countries to work together on the basis of strong bilateral relationships with each other is now more, not less, important. Despite globalization, it's still nations, their leaders, and their people who take the decisions that determine their futures. And the problems of the world are now so complex and centers of decision-making so diverse that we have to move on fully from the idea that we live in a world of blocks of allies who agree with each other about everything. Instead, we will find there are countries we need to work with on some issues, even though we disagree strongly on others. Whether it's our close and successful cooperation with Liberia and Indonesia to move beyond the Millennium Development Goals, or our work with Mexico on climate change, or successful efforts with the Russian, Indian, and Chinese navies to counter piracy off the Horn of Africa, or our work with Nordic Baltic nations to promote freedom of expression on the internet, or our burgeoning cooperation with Brazil and China on international development. While NATO played a vital role in the military intervention in Libya, the network of relationships between the US, UK, France, Qatar, and the UAE was fundamental to success. And now that Libya needs to move to the next stage of its stability, we formed a partnership last week with the US, UK, France, and Italy for our countries to collaborate on security reform there. So this new global reality requires Western nations to build up bilateral relationships, not weaken them, open embassies, not close them, and deepen the skills of their diplomats, not to rely on others to do it for them. We need to be able to create new partnerships at speed, and few nations are better placed than ours to do so. I believe that any country that does not invest in this way in bilateral diplomacy is making a major error and will be at a strategic disadvantage when it comes to defending their national interests over the long term. Building these networks doesn't mean turning away from our traditional alliances. Far from it. Doing so is essential to our security and success. Fourth, we should always show leadership based on the values of our own societies, and all Western nations should be ready to join in doing so. I'm not one of those people who expect the United States to do everything in the world. I subscribe to the view that reliance on the US for security has become too great in some countries. We have continued in the UK to spend 2% of our national income on defense and have never shirked our responsibilities to NATO and to wider peace and security. We retain the fourth largest defense budget in the world and have some of the best equipped and deployable armed forces. We'll continue to be a robust ally of the United States for the future and a first-rate military power. But I believe some European countries and others who are part of our transatlantic alliance yet have reduced their spending below that level will ultimately have to increase it again. When President Obama decided the United States would do certain things in Libya but leave it to others to take the lead, I thought it was a fair policy and an effective one. Nevertheless, there will be issues, and there are some now, on which only the United States has the leverage and can deliver the resources to do what is essential. It is an immense credit to the United States that under different administrations, it has been prepared to do so. The single most positive fact in world affairs is that the United States, that has within it such a vast range of cities and states far removed from the most troubled parts of the world, is prepared to stir itself in the face of serious international crises because it has an intelligent understanding that it is not secure if its allies are not secure. 
We've welcomed and supported for years the efforts by successive administrations to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I pay tribute to Secretary Kerry now for his efforts. But other countries also have to show leadership on difficult issues, as our Prime Minister did at the G8 last week with new agreements on tax and trade and transparency, as we've shown by leading a major effort over two years to turn around Somalia. And in the networked, highly connected world, it's more important than ever to demonstrate leadership in upholding our values. I'm proud that I've come here having presided over the UN Security Council yesterday where I was pursuing our global campaign to end the use of rape as a weapon of war. Foreign policy is not just about resolving today's crises, but also about improving the condition of humanity. When our campaigns are based on our values, we can stir the conscience of the world and change the lives of millions, and we should be inspired that we retain that capacity. And I believe we need to particularly apply this to that great moral battleground and strategic prize of this century, the advancement of full economic, social, and political rights for women everywhere. The United Kingdom and United States share an interest in making the most of the restless activism of our democracies. We'll find that millions, indeed billions, of people in other countries will aspire to do the same. We must never water down our convictions in the face of this complicated global landscape. Far from it, we must strive at all times to live up to them ourselves so that we retain and strengthen our moral authority. And the fifth principle is that we must work over the long term to persuade other nations to share our values and develop the willingness to act to defend and promote them. The truth is that many emerging powers, as we've, as we've come to call them, still have foreign policies based on non-intervention or driven by what we would consider a narrow definition of national interest, which limits their contribution to international peace and security. They don't share our sense of a responsibility to protect or readiness to intervene militarily as a last resort when human rights are violated on a massive scale. And we won't change this by lecturing them or forgetting to develop our understanding of their cultures or societies. We will change it by inspiring them and their citizens to join us over time. This requires not the exercise of tough lectures and hard power, but allowing our soft power, those rivers of ideas, diversity, ingenuity, and knowledge to flow freely in their direction. And in return, we should be open to their own good ideas, understanding that we have no monopoly of wisdom. And indeed, it's our greatest strength that we start from that assumption. Our challenge is to find a way to accommodate new voices within international institutions, while also increasing their effectiveness and strengthening a rules-based world and universal values. An expanded United Nations Security Council would only work if we can achieve this goal. So we need to open the sluice gates of our language and values and let them flow across the network world, drawing on all our immense assets and the advantages of the English language to spread the best of our ideas across the world and to bring talented young people into our countries. Our two countries are the top destinations in the world for international students, and the numbers in Britain are rising. The British Council is teaching English in more than 50 countries, and the BBC World Service has added 26 million to its audience figures in the last two years, reaching its highest ever levels. Our influence in the world is expanding, not declining. So these are my five proposals for Western nations. Reject the psychology of decline. Deliberately increase your engagement with the world. Construct strong overlapping networks. Do not be afraid to show leadership in the world based on our values. And persuade without lecturing more countries to work with us in defending and advancing those values. If we do all of these things, we will possess influence that flows rather than power that jars. We need to bring all this activism, resolve, and understanding to bear on the pressing problems we face today. We need to make every effort to persuade a new government in Iran to pursue diplomacy over its nuclear program, while not weakening our resolve to prevent proliferation. We must take what may be the last opportunity to achieve a two-state solution in the Middle East peace process. The region will be immeasurably more dangerous and unstable for Israelis and Palestinians themselves if we don't succeed. 
Despite all the dangers, we should not lose faith in the aspirations of the people of the Arab world and help those countries make a success of their long transitions. We need to press on with a new phase in our support for Afghanistan so that the Afghan lead in security is underpinned by real progress in political reconciliation. And all the time, we must maintain our commitment to the development of poorer nations. In the UK, we are proud that we're living up to our commitment to spend 0.7% of national income on international development, for that way lies long-term security and prosperity for us all. Of course, the most pressing international crisis of all today is Syria, which presents a growing threat to the region and to our own security. In Syria, the demand for democracy and accountability has been met with state violence, murder, and torture, destroying whatever legitimacy the Assad regime once enjoyed. The tragedy of Syria's people, millions of whom are now in desperate need, is the most complex and difficult crisis yet thrown up by the Arab revolutions. But it is not one from which we can turn aside. On its current trajectory, it is a crisis that will lead to even more death and suffering, a humanitarian catastrophe, the growth of extremism, and the destabilizing of neighboring countries. The answer, sooner or later, can only be a political solution in which a transitional government is agreed in a settlement bringing peace and rights for all Syrians. That is what we hope for from a second Geneva conference. Yet there will be no such solution if the regime believes they can destroy legitimate opposition by force. And that places a duty on nations dedicated to international peace and security to bolster that opposition, saving lives and promoting a transition in the process. Whether in Syria today or new conflicts in the future, we have to set a lead in confronting dangers and seizing the opportunities just as we did in the days of Thatcher and Reagan. And we should do so not out of a sense of nostalgia or excessive idealism, but because that is the only way we ensure our safety and protect our values. Winston Churchill once said, the future is unknowable, but the past should give us hope. And when we look at all that has been achieved since President Reagan held office, and remember the great advantages we have and the capabilities and freedom our nations have created over centuries, we should be fired with the confidence to build up our economies, adapt our foreign policy, and renew our strength, never surrendering to events, but retaining our belief in our ability to shape them, never talking ourselves into decline, but confidently working to expand our diplomacy and prosperity, not returning to the past, but renewing our thinking, purpose, and confidence in our values. In the 21st century, we must have the same breadth of mind to apply the best of the lessons of Ronald Reagan's time, that decline is not inevitable, that global problems can be solved, and that democratic values can prevail, and that even in the face of new threats and dangers, our countries can look and go confidently outwards to the rest of the world. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you. Secretary Haig has kindly agreed to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, all I ask is that if you have a question, if you raise your hand, we have staff members who are roaming throughout the aisles with microphones. If you could wait until we have a microphone in your hand, that would be terrific. And we'll start over here. Do we have one here? Yes. With the news of the, oh, sorry. And you just told me what to do. Right over my head. All right. Um, with the news of the NSA breaking, what do you think of the scope of how far it has infiltrated not only America's citizens, but its allies and its enemies as well? Well, um, I'm the minister responsible for these things in the um, United Kingdom, um, which of course means, uh, because of what I explained earlier, that um, I have to be careful what I say about these things. Um, after all, um, it's very important in anything we say never to give any clue or comfort, as I 
sat in our parliament um, two weeks ago to the terrorists or organized criminals or foreign intelligence agencies um, that want to harm our countries. And so we're always uh, limited in what we can say about these matters. I would simply say, as I said then, that the United States and the United Kingdom both operate on, a, on the basis of a strong framework of law and accountability and oversight with multiple checks and balances uh, in the relationship um, with Congress in the case of the United States um, and with, the, uh, with our parliament in the United Kingdom, the, the committee that is empowered to see secret uh, information. And so people who live in our countries can be confident in the strength uh, of that, uh, and a system that is based on law. Whereas, of course, many of the countries that, are, uh, that may be hostile to us or terrorists who wish to plot against us have no such constraints. But I think people can be confident in that framework of law in both our countries. We're here. We're here. Uh, Suzanne Kiampour with the BBC here. Thank you for taking my question. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, you're sending body armor and um, bulletproof vehicles and communications equipment to the Syrian rebels. Why stop short of sending arms? What is it exactly that you are waiting for? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, each country has to help in, in different ways. Uh, we've taken no decision, uh, by the way, to answer your question directly about that. We've neither ruled that out nor decided to do so uh, at the moment. Uh, we met, I just came a few days ago um, over the weekend from Doha, where 11 countries uh, met together who agree with the strategy that I mentioned towards the end of my speech, that we want a political solution in Syria. But there won't be a political solution if the moderate opposition, legitimate opposition, uh, can be destroyed by force. Uh, so different countries, I think, will help in different ways. Um, we continue to discuss all of these matters within the British government and with our allies. Um, and many countries are at different stages of, of their decision-making about this, as is quite obvious. Um, but so far, the United Kingdom has chosen to help in the way that I have described. Uh, if we were to change that, we would go to our parliament and debate it in parliament. We're a democratic country, and there would be a wide range of views about that, uh, of course. Um, so we will keep our parliament and the media informed, um, but we expect that among 11 countries and others, uh, we will each be able to assist in different ways suited to each country and it will not necessarily be each country doing exactly the same thing. We are sending equipment that helps to save lives and to bolster the opposition, uh, and that's the way we've adopted at the moment. Over here. I like your haircut. <laughs> I want to thank you for sending your troops to fight along our side in Iraq and in Afghanistan, but I have a question about climate change. What if our countries, your country and ours, does nothing? then what? If we do nothing on climate change, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you about the haircut. As, um, as uh, my dad always says, grass doesn't grow on a busy street. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you and I can be, we can, we can take comfort in that. Mm -hmm. um, we do need to act on climate change. Um, and I welcome the fact President Obama has spoken about that uh, today. And, uh, I discussed with Secretary Kerry in, in Washington two weeks ago how we increase the working together between the U.S. and the U.K. on climate change. Um, our, we have used our diplomatic uh, work uh, under both the last government in the U.K. and this government to try to promote international agreement, ultimately binding global international agreement on this issue. Um, of course, people have a variety of views about this. Even scientists have a variety of views. Uh, but the scientific consensus is that if we fail to take the necessary actions, then the consequences for the world are very serious indeed. That is the broad answer to your question. What happens if we do nothing? Many terrible things happen to international peace and security. Uh, so it is not just a... Um, it's not solely an environmental matter, massively important, though that is. Um, it also <clears throat> it means, of course, greater conflict in the future, 
uh, over resources, over water. <clears throat> and so um, it's very important to address this issue. Again, each country with its own democratic system has its own constraints. There are constraints in the United States um, through, through political opinion and, and uh, political procedures. And I don't want to um, intervene any more in the debates in another country than that. But globally, we do have to act on climate change. And that's the strong opinion of the British government and all the political parties uh, in the United Kingdom. Up here in the balcony, Mr. Secretary. Secretary, sit on. Mr. Secretary, um, we have not um, intervened in uh, the, the arming of the Assad regime by uh, Iran and Russia. Uh, have, has the international community considered a blockade? Well, um, uh, there are many ideas, of course, but um, you have to take into account the immense physical difficulty and effort required for many of those ideas. People have advocated uh, no-fly zones, humanitarian corridors. Uh, I've not heard much suggestion around the world of um, blockades because, of course, the, the geography of Syria with its many land borders, um, including land borders with countries or other elements who wish to support it, um, would make such a matter extremely difficult. It would require an immense military effort uh, to do so, raising legal questions at the United Nations and raising the questions of who would mount the military effort to do so. Um, so I, I don't think, um, as things stand, that is a realistic option, but you're right to draw attention to this problem. There is foreign intervention in Syria. of Hezbollah fighters under Iranian command um, and that is reducing the prospects for a political solution because it leads to the regime feeling it doesn't need a political solution. And that is why I believe the United States has made the declarations that it has over its policy over the last 10 days or so and why we all have to work together um, to support the legitimate opposition, as I've described earlier, in our various ways. Okay. Over here to my right. I'm sure it will work. Try again. Next year will mark a century since the outbreak of World War I, where we saw the world plunged into catastrophe with a rising Germany and a Britain that had to stare down that threat, and then, of course, later on, an even greater one from Adolf Hitler. While China obviously is in Germany, I'm curious about what you think regarding the Western coalition's engagement with China and the degree of danger we face. It's important to um, engage with China. Um, it's important because we work together every day on the United Nations Security Council uh, on a wide range of uh, issues. Uh, it's important because China is now the second largest economy in the world. Um, and I think this is where it's relevant to the, to the remarks I've just been making in my speech. Uh, it's very important to let the full flow of our ideas flow in the direction of other nations in the world. It is, um, uh, that has to happen for, for decades. Uh, that's not to say that um, China, a country with a very different culture and history, will ever become exactly like us. Um, but China, of course, is experiencing the uh, immense change to personal communication, to the availability of information, more constrained in China, much more constrained than in our own societies. But these things make um, an enormous impact. Um, and so it's very important for us to, to work with China, to engage with China, um, and to try to make sure that the emerging powers in the world take on their responsibilities for international peace and security. So I'd look at it that way around, rather than in the way that you are inviting me to do uh, in your question. I think we have time for two more questions. We'll go right here. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you for having us. I'm one of the uh, 2013 GE Reagan scholars. Um, with uh, Prime Minister Cameron saying uh, he's setting a firm date for the EU referendum with the citizens of the United Kingdom, and uh, your speech speculate, or talking more about how uh, global cooperation among Western nations is very important. I wanted to see what your opinion is if the referendum um, goes through, how UK policy um, would change in foreign policy 
especially in consideration to Europe if the UK reconsidered its position with the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues on your scholarships, um, which I hope are very, very successful for you all. Um, in the United Kingdom, which is a um, robust democracy, uh, as you know, uh, th this issue cannot be avoided. It's our view that there, there will be a referendum on this issue at some stage in the United Kingdom, and the Prime Minister and I believe that it's better to confront that, to shape the debate, to lead the debate, to set a time by which we'll have the referendum. It's the best way to resolve the issue. Uh, but to do everything we can between now and then to make sure that Europe becomes more competitive, more flexible, better able to succeed in this challenging world I've been describing, so that British people can choose not between leaving the EU now or the status quo now, but between leaving or being part of an improved European Union. We want the chance to show that we can achieve that. Um, and we intend and believe that we will achieve that and then be able to campaign for British membership of the European Union. So we're not advocates, not our position to, um, we're not taking any different position from that. People in that referendum campaign would have to weigh the foreign policy and economic policy advantages and disadvantages of our EU membership, but that is how we're approaching it as the British government. Our final question we'll take from right up here in the balcony. So, um, I don't think we've got the microphone working there yet. Oh, I think I heard the, um, you were asking about another referendum, the one in um, Scotland, which is taking place in, um, on the 18th of September next year. I've just come from Scotland as well, actually. I was there on um, Thursday. I've been moving around quite a bit uh, in the last week. Um, I believe very passionately in the United Kingdom staying together. We're, we are greater than the sum of our parts. Um, and I believe Scotland will make that choice too. Uh, the surveys at the moment are two to one in favor of um, Scotland staying part of the UK. Uh, I think that's very much in the interests of Scotland, as well as of the UK and as well as of our friends around the world. So if you're passing by Scotland, give them a bit of a tip and um, <laughs> a bit of advice. <laughs> that the world needs the UK to stay together. Mm. Mr. Secretary, on behalf of Mrs. Reagan and all of our guests here tonight, we want to th thank you and say how much we've been honored by your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Great.